Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At FilmmakerU.com, we create courses for professionals to deepen and diversify their existing skill set. Every Friday, we go live at 2 p.m. Eastern with a film professional to chat and give you a chance to join in and ask questions. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by Michael Barenbaum, editor and writer now. Uh, hi, Mo uh, hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, let's start off. What have you been doing, like, work-wise on this pandemic <laughs> during this pandemic work wise i've been i've been paying myself to watch netflix um it's been you know once everything shut down it's uh, been it's been slow obviously i uh, uh i finished up a movie right before this all started uh called marry me i wrapped up on that it was uh, it's a uh, jennifer lopez and owen wilson uh, uh romantic comedy um I think it was supposed to come out in the fall. Now I hear maybe Valentine's Day, but who knows? It, it may show up on the Peacock. I, I, you know, we don't know at this point what's going to happen with movie theaters. Um, I luckily uh, I had been working on an indie film with a friend of mine for about four years. Uh, it was an interesting project where. Uh, a bunch of actors, we got a bunch of actors together. My, the director had started doing this film. It was mostly an improv movie. And we found that uh, this, we needed more of a story. So we started writing together and adding scenes in. We'd watch the film and say, well, we need a scene where this happens. And then we, we need a scene where this happens. And we sort of built the script in reverse. We sort of like had a little nugget of about what I what I ended up cutting down to about 15 minutes. It started out at about 45 minutes of this improv. And uh, over the next couple of years, we st just started shooting scenes when people were available and weren't working. And we had just finished the film right uh, in April. And, um, you know, it sounds like it's it would be kind of a mess, but it, it's turned out really well. And we're kind of proud of it. And we're, um, Doing just, we're looking into distribution uh, deals right now. Um, it's called Making the Day, and uh, hopefully we'll get it out and people will be able to see it. Um, other than that, because we had such a good experience, my friend uh, Mike Canzanero and I, uh, we co-wrote it and he directed it. We're now working on another script. Um, hopefully we'll be finished before uh, we go back to work. Hopefully go back to work uh, shortly, but that's what, we, that's what I've been doing. So did you guys start with a script and then go and shoot and then start doing the alterations or did you guys shoot something small for fun and then slowly build like that? Cause it sounds like yeah. you didn't have yeah, a script. There was no script to start with. <laughs> okay. my, my, friend, my friend Mike started, I wasn't on at the beginning. Mm -hmm. He took a bunch of actors out and had many camera crew. He had a big camera crew. So the actors would do a scene. They'd have like a concept kind of like a curb your enthusiasm thing. They'd have a concept, they'd improv improvise the scene. Then maybe they'd get into a cab and th there'd be another camera crew waiting at the other end where they were arriving or they would, the camera crew would follow them into the subway. And it, it's basically about this, this guy who's trying to make an independent film about his relationship with his deceased wife. He just wants to tell their story. And the, the, the parallel story is about this actress who's looking to find her this part apart and she thinks that the part of this guy's wife is was written for her and they just sort of like you know it's along the lines of living in oblivion the Tom oh, yeah. Pillow movie where yeah. trying to get this film made is not so easy and you know they come across many obstacles but there was no script and after this initial shoot with all the actors um it's, one of my friends, uh, he has a production company. So one of his editors put this stuff together. And uh, it was, like I said, it was about 45 minutes. And then he just started coming up with new scenes and he brought me in to, to cut those. And then I recut the original stuff. And then we just started talking and just seeing where the story could go and what we needed to build it up to create a, a, a fuller story, flesh out the characters. And we just, uh, over the next, like I said, a few years, we just added all these scenes in until we got, ended up with a 90 minute movie. And from the reactions we've had at screenings, 
it actually came out really well, Surpri surprisingly to me. But <laughs> it's, very, it's very touching and very funny. Now, uh, Daniel Pagan says hi. I don't know. Hey, if Danny, you know. how are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's good to hear at least one person is watching. So what would you say are some of the challenges then from an editing standpoint of not having a script <laughs> well, and editing? That's true. I mean, it was all improvised. Um, so that in itself is a challenge because uh, you, you have one angle where they're doing one thing and then you have another angle that, you know, they're doing something that maybe was, you know, they thought of later in the day. Um, so it, it's just... a they didn't always have two cameras. Sometimes, you know, uh, later in the shoot, I insisted they have two cameras because <laughs> it was just became a little crazy, but cutting improv improvisation is definitely has its uh, difficulties, but, um, you know, got through it and, uh, you know, you find you cut down, the more you cut out, the better it gets. So that was part of the challenge and find, you know, deleting scenes, stuff that uh, the director loved turns out it didn't work he put me as as an actor in the couples in a scene um that didn't work out i kind of cut myself <laughs> out of the movie and the movie's much better for it but were uh, you were you the character of the editor because there's when i, I was the credits. I was. <laughs> I and, and the, the main actor came up to me and thanked me for helping him put his movie together and i was like you know what uh that guy it can't act and uh we don't need this scene anyway so it's gonna go but you could have had your moment like Alan Heim in, uh, in his I could movie. have. I could have. <laughs> I, I still have that opportunity ahead, I think. Yeah. So now when you're cutting something that's uh, improv, it sounds like you're saying cutting down not only the moments, but scenes. But did you find uh, actors tended to just keep going and you needed to tighten that up? or <laughs> That was one of the biggest issues because the actors always felt that they had to be talking or they had to be doing something. And so there would be no lull in the conversation. But sometimes we needed to create moments, create pauses, have an actor just look at the other actor instead of talking on top of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that was definitely part of it. You know, there was a scene where it was sort of a, um, an emotional scene, just two actors on a sofa. And they all, they just felt they just needed to keep going and keep talking. So we cut a lot of that out and just let some, let one of them talk and let the other listen. Um, so yeah, you, it was a lot of creating moments that didn't really exist um, and creating a lot of, and, and just eliminating a lot of babble that, you know, was unrelated to the story. It was just finding what did we need? What are the essential moments for the scenes? What are the jokes? Don't, you don't want to diffuse the jokes by just letting people add words here and there. So it was just fine tuning it and really whittling it down. Now I want to jump to Sex in the City. Um, how did you get involved with that show initially? I got called to go in for an interview. Um, I was, and I met with Susan Seidelman who directed the pilot. I went into the office, we had a really nice meeting she said, oh, there's Darren over there, Darren Starr. I, I, had, I had no idea who Darren <laughs> Starr was. I said, oh, hello. Um, and uh, they hired me. I mean, it was, it was mostly based on the fact that I had done a pilot called Dear Diary that David Frankel directed. And it starred B.B. Newworth. It was for ABC. And it was, it was very fast paced, very, um, it was a, it was a narration by B.B. Newworth about her day on, it was her birthday. She was turning, I, I can't remember if she was turning 30 or 40 or something like that. And it was just all about her day. And it was chopped, cut, very quickly cut. It was, it was not picked up by ABC as a series, but the producer released it as a short film in Los Angeles. And it won the Oscar for best live action short. Wow. And after that, the Oscars changed the rules for that category. None of the films could be, could have been made for a different medium. Yeah, uh -huh. it has to be made as a short film. But anyway, it won the Oscar. <laughs> David has his, the Oscar. And uh, it, 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 they wanted that type of feel. So 
they thought I was a, a good fit for the show. And was AB, ABC upset that they released? <laughs> yeah. oh, no. Maybe, yeah. I, I think I think David said, "Good thing those guys turned it down because yeah. now I have this uh, little man here." Um, so, but it was a year. It was a year before, we, after we did the pilot for Sex and the City, before it went into production as a series. And you worked on the pilot, correct? I cut the pilot. Yes. Yeah. So how did you? Because one of the things that's always the toughest with pilots is getting the structure down, right? Cause you're trying to figure out <clears throat> yeah. like, how is this going to work? So what, how yeah. did you work with the creators to come up with this sort of feel for the show? Uh, you're right. We, you have to sort of figure out what the tone is, what's, what kind of music is appropriate. Um, and it did go through a lot of changes, it, even into the second season, they, you know, things changed. It, it, originally it had Sarah Jessica doing uh, talking to the camera and sort of band on the street testimonials. They were intercut with some of the scenes um, that went through the first season. And then that was all dropped, but we tried different things like having uh, floating boxes across the screen with people talking and split screens and uh, all kinds of things. Even in, in the first season, we did like these wipes with high heel shoes and <laughs> champagne glasses uh, um, all that stuff kind of went away, but um, yeah, I mean, after I worked with Susan Seidelman on the, sh on the show, then Darren came in and uh, we, you know, it changed a little bit. It, it became a little slightly less visual in terms of shots and more about the dialogue and tightening up the dialogue and keeping the uh, voiceover as the real skeleton of the show and just building everything around that. It was more about the words than the pictures. So, basically. so why did they abandon her looking directly at the camera then? Because it almost feels like something out of, um, oh, what's that British show that just was really popular? Um, uh, oh, uh, Fleabag. Fleabag, yeah. <laughs> yeah right? Where she show. stops and looks at the camera and talks. It sounds yeah. very similar. So really, like, she's hilarious. <laughs> this was not quite that. This was, um, I think... I think the audience just didn't like it. And uh, it, the word came in and uh, the producers said, well, let's just drop that and stick more as a real, truly uh, narrative type of thing. Um, I, I wasn't really there in the writer's room or in the producer's room to know why that happened, but that was the sense I got. Now we have a question here from Alan and he wants to know, uh, what would you say is the most important skill in editing? Uh, and what was your first professional job in the editing world? I'll answer the second one first. Um, I got an internship on a, uh, a movie uh, called uh, Alphabet City with Vincent Spano and Jamie Gertz. Um, I was in college. I got this internship and uh, I was working in the Brill Building. Sound One was the yeah. company that was there. It's no longer there, but it was sort of one of the main editing places in New York back in the, in the 80s. And just by being in that building, I, I had my editing bench was in the hallway. Um, and I was working and people would go by and talk. It was very social and you'd meet people. And um, just by being there, uh, I, when I was finished, I took my little resume around and uh, if I go jump back a bit, prior to that, I had an internship right before that working at Kaufman Story Studios when they were shooting the movie, The Cotton Club, Francis Ford Coppola movie. And um, I used to go down to the set and hang out with the dancers and the extras and just, uh, just to be around the filmmaking part of it. And then, but my internship was with the executives from the studio. And at one point they told me I couldn't go down to the studio anymore. I couldn't go down to the stages anymore. So that was my last day. I quit that day, got the internship on Alphabet City. And then after that, because I had, I had worked on the set of Cotton Club, Cotton Club was still in post-production. And uh, I was hired as an apprentice sound editor on the Cotton Club. And that was my first professional job. Wow. And what was your first editing gig, like as an editor? picture. I got a job 
it was it was a movie called Bum Rap, which you'll no one will have seen, <laughs> and that's probably all the better. Um, I was working on it's a funny story. I was working on a movie called Patty Hearst, uh, a Paul Schrader movie. I, I was the assistant editor, and I got a call one weekend saying that they wanted me to come in and interview to be the editor on this job for this movie, Bum Rap. And I was like, I don't know these people, I, I'm already working, it was, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not available. And then I hung up and then I thought, this is an editing job they're offering me to come get. I, I should just do, I should just try and get it. So I, I called the guy back, went in, and for whatever reason, they hired me to edit this movie. I don't know where they got my name, how they got my name. When we were finishing up the movie, I said to the director, how did you find me? Why did you call me? He said, well, my brother is in this, was in this fraternity at Emory University and one of his frat brothers was this guy named Fred. And he said he had a friend who made movies. He was an editor in New York and uh, he recommended you. So <laughs> it was just this fluke thing that a friend of mine from high school went to college with the director's brother. <laughs> and that's how I got my first job. And then to follow up with his other question, what yeah. is the most important skill? I think a, a lot of it is being a good politician. You have to work with a, a, a different assortment of people. You have to negotiate your way through um, the different cuts. You, you have to work in a room for a long time, for many hours with the director, with the producer, getting studio notes, getting network notes getting actor's notes sometimes. And you have to have a calm demeanor and just be able to like get along with people. And, and besides that, you have to be a good editor. Um, and, you know, getting a job is firstly being lucky enough to get an opportunity to cut something, but then you have to, you know, you have to back that up with the skills uh, in order to get the next job. So, and obviously you, your skills improve over time, you know, experience, uh, practice makes perfect. Although there's, there's no perfection in editing. There's always, uh, there's no perfect cut. There's always somebody who has a note for something who <laughs> to run out of time. But um, yeah, it's just, just being able to produce a good cut and uh, navigate your way through the politics that uh, ensue. Any, any tricks you can give us for navigating the politics? Because that's a tricky landmine it riddle is. field. It's, it's, it's being able to uh, get your, I mean, you're, it's not your thing. You know, you're, you're working for a director or, or a producer. You, you want to make them happy. But, you know, you, your fingerprints are on it too. And your name is on it. So you want it to be the best you think it can be as well. So it's a matter of... Uh, uh, sneaking in your ideas and sometimes having to let other people think it was their idea, but, you know, getting it to where you want. Uh, and, and things, you know, nobody's, nobody gets everything they want. It's a lot of negotiating and trying things out. And, you know, a lot of people will, you know, you'll be sitting in a room and someone, someone will come up with an idea that just sounds ludicrous. And you just think, oh my God, this is going to be a waste <laughs> of two hours. But you do it and you show them this is not working, but nine out of 10 times that ludicrous path you take will lead to a, a third path that does, that does make sense and does uh, work out better. Um, so, you know, you go, you try any different thing and you just uh, find out what, what works best. Now, Janine has a question about the technology that you know. And so she wants to know, um, have you used Premiere Pro before or After Effects, uh, or do you primarily work on the Avid system? I, I only work on the Avid system. Um, it's, it's what I know, it's what I'm comfortable with. I know it from the back of my hand. I, I don't have to think about it. Um, I have been hired to, to recut projects that have been cut on Final Cut or Premiere Pro. Um, uh, I did learn Final Cut to cut this, to recut this one movie. Uh, when I've done projects on Premiere recently, I just have, I have an assistant who knows it sit with me and I sort of 
tell them what to do because it, it, it gets a little too frustrating. And it's, you know, when I, when I have my, if it's my choice, if, it, if I'm hired to do something from scratch, it'll always be an avid. So um, I, I don't really know Premiere Pro. Um, I, I don't know After Effects. I, I've taken a bunch of the tutorials and uh, it, it's, so, it's such a deep uh, program that I, I don't know. I only know the very, very basics. Yeah. A director I worked with recently was very proficient in it. And while I was cutting scenes, he'd be on his laptop doing our temp effects. And he was unbelievable at it. It was, it was really helpful to have somebody like right there doing it. Um, but I would certainly recommend anyone out there listening, if you're trying to move ahead, to learn as many programs as you can if you're trying to get ahead. Because if you know After Effects, it, it, it will be really helpful to get yourself hired. Yeah. Well, and it's crazy because you never know who's going to call and be like, I've cut, you know, I got a call two weeks ago and they were like, I started this in Final Cut 7. <laughs> it yes. was a documentary. And they were like, and I don't know what system to go to now because yeah. their computer no longer handles it. And I was like, "Ooh, you got to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, even this, even making the day, this, the film yeah. I was telling you about earlier, that was started in Premiere. And when I came on and started cutting, I said, we have to switch to an Avid. Um, so 90% of it was cut on an Avid. That original 15 minutes was on Final Cut. And we basically... They took my Avid cut and brought that into Premiere and just made the uh, the full offline cut to go to the the uh, color, you know, the online editor as a Premiere cut. Yeah. Well, it's and yeah, it's great. Well, you you mentioned earlier that you actually started in sound. So, what did you learn as a sound person that you use every day as an editor? Well, I tell you, I uh, I use sound a lot and I was also a music editor and all those skills come into play almost every day because sometimes you're you're cutting a scene and you uh you're trying to make a cut and it just isn't working you, you just what's wrong with this and then you add a sound effect and then you go oh that works and all you did was put a a car by under it or, or something like that um and I, I learned how to cut dialogue I learned how to cut music and, you know, it's, it's all trial by fire. You're just kind of thrown in and said, you know, do this. I, 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 uh, I remember I was working on the movie, The Untouchables, Brian De Palma film. I was cutting Foley's on that. And actually, I actually cut all the Foley's for the, the uh, Potemkin steps. Awesome. You know, steps. <laughs> and uh, th there's a scene where the, uh, I think a, a bucket gets knocked over and it's the uh, supervising sound editor rec recorded some sound effects at his home that weekend and he gave them to me to cut. And I was like, uh, it doesn't quite fit. And he's like, you have to cut it. And so, you know, you go, oh, all right, you know, you figure it out. And it, it's just a lot of like uh, experimenting and you learn how to do it. You see what works, what doesn't work. Um, but, uh, all those skills come into play every day. Yeah. Now, what was it like working on that sequence? Because it's a throwback to an even more famous sequence. Exactly. It was very cool. I mean, you know, I, I, I had to do all the, every time the baby carriage bumped the next step, <laughs> it was, you know, bump, bump. I, I was basically putting all the Foley's in sync that had been shot for that sequence. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. I was on it just for like a couple of weeks, but it was, it yeah. was great. Wow. Now, someone, uh, Anissa, wants to follow up the tech question with uh, what shortcuts do you like in Avid? Like, what's your favorite shortcut in, what's in Avid? What's your favorite shortcut? Wow. Command Z? <laughs> yeah, let me think back to when I was actually editing six months ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I, I tell you what, I, I like to put... Um, well, this is, I mean, I, I just this, some of the keyboard shortcuts that I like to use getting to my mixer, to my equalizer, to my, uh, um, I, I like to put a lot of uh, speed changes in a bin so that I can get to them quickly rather than recreate them all the time. Although some, you know, sometimes you uh, have to finesse one here or there. Um, 
you know, I'm not, I'm, it's funny, but I'm not really a fan of rubber banding. And I, I do things, it's sort of like the old fashioned way. If there is an old fashioned way with an avid, I still mm. just use a lot of like dissolves in my sound. Um, I found that there was one, um, one time in this film, Marry Me, I was working on where I needed the music to come in in a very specific way and just a dissolve didn't work. So uh, I worked with my assistant to rubber band it to make it come in the correct way. And uh, you know, maybe I'll use it going, going forward. I sort of put handcuffs on my assistants who, who like to use it, um, but I don't let them. <laughs> I loved, I had it set up for a while and then I, I had to move the mixer out, but I had my mixer connected so I could just use the faders and like record it basically as I was going. So it was, I would just hit record and then like lower it, it fade out and it was great. It was, but you know, it mixers take up a lot of space. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a lot of faders. <laughs> yeah, especially when uh, you have like 30 tracks or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, Anessa wants to follow up that question with what, what are some of the important factors when to consider when you're establishing the tone of a piece? Well, I mean, it, it's sort of predetermined in a way, depending on how the director shot it. it, it part of the skills that are helpful um, is being able to look at the dailies and, and, just instinctually know what the director's going for. Sometimes th they're shot in a way where it's planned out and it's mapped out and it's, and you know exactly what's going to go where, uh, you know, things change, but you know, this is obviously the first shot of the scene and then we'll go back and forth between the main characters and this moment goes here. And sometimes directors just, just shoot a bunch of coverage and you have to figure it out. But, you know, the tone is sort of a little established. Sometimes you uh, you can change something uh, by the music you put in. Like there was a scene, I did a movie for Netflix called In the Shadow of the Moon. It was a, a sort of science fiction action detective movie. And there was one scene that was shot, uh, one of the characters was a, a uh, scientist and he was in his lab and there was all these pigs there and he was, testing his latest creation on these pigs. And I first, I put the scene together and it just seemed so like cheesy to me. It just seemed very jokey and, uh, you know, like a fifties uh, science fiction movie with aliens. Um, and I called the director, I said, I'm a little worried about this scene. It's, 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 it's a little cheesy. And he's like, mm, yeah, I, I thought that a little bit too. So when he got to the editing room, we, we sort of, you know, toned, we uh, trimmed it down a little bit. We changed the music. Once we changed the music, it, it changed the whole feeling of the scene. Um, so that, that has a, a big impact on what uh, the scene is. Um, just uh, changing the point of view of the scene, like having it seen through one of the character's eyes rather than uh, you know, making it more about one person can change the tone of the scene. Um, I mean, there's a lot you can do. It sometimes uh, I'll get hired to recut something, and they'll say, "We don't. We want to eliminate this entire character from the film." And you go, "Okay, well, that'll be a challenge." And um, you just take it as a as a uh, uh, how are we going to do this? You just say, "Well, how can we go about this?" And you just find a way. So. Part of being an editor is always being able to find an answer to solve a problem. That's, that's also one of the biggest things. Always have ways out of something. Um, there was a scene in the Sex and the City movie, the, the first one, where we lifted out a scene with Kim Cattrall. It was during this fashion show sequence. We lifted out the entire scene. It was sort of tangential and the movie was long. Um, but then connecting A and C, you saw her leave in A and then cut to C and she, she needed to be there. How are we going to get her back? Because she left to do this other scene. Well, we found a shot of just her like sitting down in a chair and we cut it in. It's a quick shot. It solved the problem. And even now when I see the director, sometimes he's like, remember how we like made her show up in that scene? That was unbelievable. I can't believe how did we figure that out? So you just, you know, it's just patching holes and and uh, 
solving problems. I think we opened a can of worms with the untouchable scene because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, you know one person wants to know what sound libraries you like to use. Uh, uh, Tyson wants to know that, or what sound li- uh, sound do you rely on? So- um, I have collected over the years um, a bunch of libraries. Uh, it's Hollywood, it's Hollywood sound, sound ideas. Um, plus, uh, whenever I'm on a film and the sound editors pass me temp stuff. I add that to my catalog. My assistants have their own sound libraries. So uh, it, it's pretty large at this point. Um, I, I don't even remember some of the names of them. They're just like on my drive that I take with me from job to job. I've also collected uh, a bunch of temp music soundtracks over the years. I just keep I just keep building uh, on it and, uh, you know, go back and look for stuff that I need when I, but I don't even look at the names of the catalogs anymore. I just like type in, you know, exterior barnyard or something, you know, whatever I'm looking for. Uh, Beto wants to know um, how much do you stick to the script when you're cutting and how much do you diverge and sort of throw in your creative process or your creative self to it? Yeah. Well, it depends on, my relationship with the director. Um, if, if it's someone that I've worked with before, I will, I, it's not like that I'm diverging from the script, but I'll, from watching the scene, I'll cut the scenes and I'll realize that this is way too long. This is never going to be able to last this long. So I'll cut a short version. I'll, I'll edit it myself before I even show it to the director. Um, and when they see it, they'll either go, oh, well, that's, just, that's interesting, great. Or they'll go, well, where's my other, where's the other scene? Where's the other lines? And I'll have that, I'll have cut the whole scene, but I'll have trimmed it down as well. Um, I, I did an episode of a uh, show called Happen Leonard. Um, and there was a scene on a porch and it was about, it was about like eight minutes long of dialogue. And I knew this, there's no way you can have an eight minute dialogue scene in a, in a 45 minute show. <laughs> so I cut it down to like four minutes and it aired that way. It, no one ever questioned it or had a problem with it. So yeah, you can get, you can cut stuff down if you feel there's a better way. Uh, if you're working you know, with a director for the first time you can ask them, like, I, I think I can shorten this. And they'll say, great, do it. Or um, no, leave it long. We'll, we'll look at it together and trim it down. So it depends on your relationship with who you're working with. But I, I, I aim to deliver an editor's cut that is arable, that is like my version of the final cut. I've yet to have a cut that ended there. It's, it's, that's what I was saying before, there's never a perfect cut. Everyone always has notes and, and it's very collaborative. The notes ultimately always make it better, but you try and deliver the best cut that you can because that, that's putting you that much further towards the, the goal line. Well, and it goes back to the political, being able to balance the politics, right? Knowing that I have to ask to do this if I've never worked with this director. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you don't want to, have to show them your cut and it's like so different from the script that they're, I mean, a director is going to freak out anyway, <laughs> no matter what you show them. Directors always want to like just hang themselves after they see the first cut of their film or TV show. And um, so I, I find it's like a, a great success when they watch it and go, oh, I don't want to kill myself. Um, it's a good starting place. So th- that's like, that's the best you can ask for. Uh, Scott Janush says, I'm here too. <laughs> <laughs> nice to hear from you. Uh, Anissa also wants to know, how did you, how do you like to approach your first cut? So like you've got the footage, you're alone in the room. How do you like to start? I, you know, I, I developed this method and, you know, some people I've other, I've heard other people use it um, as well, but I don't screen all the dailies. Uh, at the beginning. I will have my bin set up with all the different shots. I'll watch the master. I'll watch one take of uh, 
all the different setups so I know what exists. And then I will just start working my way through a scene. I'll, I'll say, okay, what's, where are we gonna start? And then I'll look at, from all the dailies, the different takes of that particular shot I think I'm gonna start with. And okay, where am I gonna cut? I'll find a spot I think I'm gonna get out of the shot. Where am I gonna go next? I'll look at shot B, look at all the takes of shot B for that next couple of seconds. What's the best version? What's the best take? I'll cut on take B. Where am I going next? Shot C. I'll look at all of the couple of seconds for the next line of dialogue that I need from that scene. And then I'll, I'll just build out the scene. So by the end of cutting the scene, I will have seen all the dailies, but not straight through, because I'm not a very good note taker. I, I found that when I would watch all the dailies straight through and try and take notes, I would finish and look down and have like, two things scribbled on my page and have forgotten where I saw things. And, you know, so that just didn't work for me. So I just sort of developed this method where I, by the time I finish cutting, by the time I finish seeing the dailies, I've also already cut the scene. Um, and, and then I start there. I, you know, as the scenes come in day by day, you put them together, build the scenes. I have a scene bin where I just accumulate scenes. And once I have a, a series of scenes, put them in order, build a sequence, build a reel, whatever, an act. And, and then the next step is watching that sequence and uh, seeing what I, you know, what doesn't work and where can I improve it. Um, that, that's where I really fine tune it quite a bit when I see a, a, a whole sequence in a row. Um, I almost sometimes recut things from scratch when I see how it's playing in the sequence but uh, you need to throw it together to see what you have. And I like to do that as quickly as possible, not like dwell on anything really. Do you ever take it home to watch it at home? Or, cause I remember people were doing that burning it to DVDs for a while and screening at home and seeing how it plays. No, I, I never did that. I, 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 I tend to, if, if there's a problem, I go home maybe thinking about it and try and come up with a solution to go back the next day. And sometimes you're working on a thing working on something and you can't get it to work, you can't get it to work, you go back the next day and the answer just presents itself. It's just like, oh, that, yeah, why didn't I try that before? Um, some scenes, uh, where sometimes when they're very uh, complicated or, or there's lots of dailies, I'll, I'll put it off, put it off, put it off. Um, I'll, have, I'll have watched the dailies, parts of them, and know what the scene needs to be ultimately, but I just don't want to deal with it right now. So like, oh, they're hitting the scene just a wonder. Let me work on that today. Um, and then at some point you, you run out of other things to do and you need to attack that scene, but it's been gelling in your mind. You just sort of fi figure out a way to go about it. And then I find that once I decide I need to do something like that, I just sort of like zone in and I, I can't, it's just like, it appears. I, sometimes when I'm done cutting a scene, I don't even remember doing it. Um, but it just, uh, you get so locked into it that um, you just do it shot by shot, step by step, and and uh, you have a scene at the end. Now, Steve has a question here for you. And um, I'm going to preface this by saying, uh, you don't have to name names. <laughs> okay. He wants to know, he wants to know uh, what was your worst editing experience? If you're comfortable saying that, I will also say. Um, it was probably, it was, it was a, a film where they didn't shoot a lot of coverage. And I kept saying to the producer and the director, they're not shooting enough. They're not shooting enough. It's going to be hard to put this together. And I've had that experience. It's the worst. <laughs> and I'm, I was like, guys, we're going to be in trouble. And, you know, they finished, the, you know, the end of the shoot came and they looked at some scenes and they said, thanks, Michael, but you're fired. <laughs> and it was like, okay, well, I, I warned you. You got good, good luck putting the rest of it. Good, good luck putting it together. Oof. Or That's I was on a, yeah, I mean, I was on a TV show where there were multiple executive producers who who never agreed with each other. And one would come in and cut with work with me. 
And then the next one would come in and say, forget what that guy said, let's do it this way. And then the next guy would come in and said, don't listen to them, let's do it my way. And it, it, it never got better. It just was like, you know, a, a different way of going about it, but it, it never improved. So anyway, those things happen. Uh, Anissa is back and she wants to know, uh, what conversations do you like to have with the director before you start a project? Or what would you like to ask, I guess, the director before you start a project? Well, I, I usually the first thing I ask is how they like to work. Um, I know how I like to work, but I don't want to impose my way on them if they have a way that they prefer. I, um, I will say, uh, do you want to see scenes, a, a bunch of scenes at the end of a week? Do you want to see cut scenes every day? Do you want to not see the movie at all until I, you finish shooting and I just show you the whole movie? I tell them I recommend that way um, because uh, then you'll get an, an overall impression of the movie and, and not get caught up in any indiv individual scene or individual cut. Um, I mean, I've worked with directors who want to be sitting with me all day long and, and every cut they're like, show me that take again, show me this take again. Uh, let's try cutting here, let's try cutting there. And, you know, I, I like to work very fast. And when I'm in that situation, it just, it, it's like molasses. So, um, uh, but that's their, that's their method and, and they need to go through that process. That director ultimately said to me, next time I, I won't come in for a while, you do it and then I'll look at the movie. Um, I, I prefer to just work by myself put the whole thing together, have the director see a, a screening, and and then we go back and dig in, start at scene one. Um, sometimes I'll go to the set and I'll, I'll bring a scene or, you know, if uh, the director is curious about how one thing is working or is afraid something isn't working, um, I'll, I'll put that particular scene together and go uh, sit with them and show them stuff and uh, say, you know, do we need another shot? Do we need to, uh, you know, what do we do about this? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, how they like to work is, is usually my main question. I talk about transitions because sometimes directors don't think about that. I say, you know, give it a thought. You know, if you can shoot something that seems like it was done on purpose, it will work out better than just like finding something in the cutting room. Um, but, uh, since you're going to be sitting in a room with them for many months and many hours, just like sort of finding a, a common way of working. I mean, the director on, uh, on Marry Me told me that she hated post and <laughs> uh, she like really didn't look forward to it. She loved being on set. And afterwards, she had such a great time. She's like, you, you changed my whole way of thinking about post. Um, I think, I don't know whether it was just a personality thing or what she had gone through before, I'm not sure, but um, so yeah, it could be really, it could be really fun. And um, usually it is fun up until when the studio gets involved. Uh, Mark Osborne says, hello from MTO. Hey. Uh, <laughs> um, now you mentioned, uh, you know, when we were talking about the worst situation that uh, you had multiple executives sort of each changing it. How do you tackle something like that? from a political stance? Like, how do you, I guess, get them into a room and, and discuss it? <laughs> well, it's not your job. It's, 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 they have to sort it out between them. You just can do the cut and they, you know, here's the latest version. And one guy, well, where, where's, I thought we changed that to this. And, oh, well, Mr. X decided to change this. He came in after you you guys go decide which version you want to use and then come back and tell me because, you know, we can just keep going back and forth. I mean, you don't have the power to make the final decision. So you can only try to accommodate, you know, the bosses and uh, it's just, it's, it's an ex exercise in patience ultimately. Um, so they, they basically have to duke it out. Uh, you've been very generous with your time here. So I have one last question I'd like to ask you. Uh, hey, um, all yours. Uh, <laughs> been a pleasure. What, uh, what 
what show would you recommend that you've been watching during quarantine that people should check out? Oh my God, I have a list. <laughs> okay, have a list. give us the list. Um, the, the, the best show that I've seen the whole time has been Somebody Feed Phil. This is a doc series about Phil Rosenthal, the co-creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. And he goes to different cities around the world and just tastes their food, meets with people, explores the culture. It is so endearing. He's so charming and goofy. I, I just love the show. That was the, the nonfiction show I loved. Um, the other ones I thought were great, the American shows I watched, I love Bosch which is on Amazon. I loved Ozark. Um, but recently I've been getting into all these foreign shows, um, all subtitled shows, uh, anywhere from uh, a show called Money Heist, a Spanish show, yeah. to Babylon Berlin was a German show that I've been watching. Fauda is an Israeli show. Um, this murder mystery from Iceland called The Valhalla Murders, uh, a show from Finland called Dead Wind is excellent. Um, yeah, I've been really enjoying these foreign episodes, these foreign shows, they've been, they're really good. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for letting us interview. Um, next you. week, we're gonna be joined by Jeffrey Wolf, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern time here on Friday. Thanks again. Say hi to uh, Jeff for me. I will. Thanks a lot, okay. Michael. Thank you. Bye.